Hello and welcome to this online broadcast from Advent Lutheran Church in Lake Ann, Michigan. We are so glad that you've found us. We think it's God's purpose that you've found us today. Um, I am here to bring the gospel and the sermon text for uh, the third Sunday of Advent, which is going to be December 12th, 2021. Let's pray. Stir up the wills of your faithful people, Lord God, and open our ears to the preaching of John, that rejoicing in your salvation, we may bring forth the fruits of repentance through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to the crowds who came out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruits worthy of repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our ancestor. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children to Abraham. Even now, the axe is lying at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, What then should we do? In reply, he said to them, Whoever has two coats must share with anyone who has none, and whoever has food must do likewise. Even tax collectors came to be baptized, and they asked him, Teacher, what should we do? He told them, Collect no more than the amount prescribed for you. Soldiers also asked him, And we, what should we do? He said to them, Do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be satisfied with your own wages. As the people were filled with expectation and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered them all by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of him sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with the unquenchable fire. So with many other exhortations, he proclaimed the good news to the people. The gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. In the pantheon of fictional villains, you can read stacks of books and watch hours of movies and never find a villain quite so devious, devil, devilish, and downright unlikable as Draco Malfoy, the bully-in-chief of the Harry Potter series. It's not just that this guy is mean. It's that he feels he's allowed to be mean. It's justified. It's necessary because he's in Slytherin house and Slytherins are the best. It's his birthright as the power, a son of the powerful wizard Lucius Malfoy. Tribe and family status are everything to him. So when he speaks various versions of his well-known catchphrase, wait till my father hears about this. It's worse than any dark incantation because it's all too real. There may be no such thing as magic spells, but the spell of privilege, of using one's power and family connections to brutalize others, that's something we've all seen probably too many times. Slytherin House itself is fictional, but bullies are real and a dime a dozen. When the John the Baptist looks at the crowd of people and says, you brood of vipers, 
The first voice that I heard in my head is Draco Malfoy's, Malfoy's voice. And it's not just because Slytherin House mascot is a snake. It's because of that constant refrain from him. Wait till my father hears about this. The threat of calling in favors based on one's family. John the Baptist says, do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children of Abraham. John knows way too many people obsessed with status. Obsessed with what tribe and family you come from. What structures of power you were born into. Which birthrights you can claim. God made the universe from nothing. If God just wanted more people from the right kind of families, God could make them out of these river rocks. What God wants instead is repentance. Change. Not just change that happens in the quiet of our homes, in the silence of our spirits, but change in our spirits that creates change in our behavior, that bears fruit. Bearing fruit worthy of repentance means not just turning back towards God, but actually acting like it daily. And the subversive thing about John's teaching and later his cousin Jesus' teaching is you don't have to be from the right tribe or family or Hogwarts house in order to change. Anybody can do it. Anyone. And conversely, God isn't going to let certain trees stay put just because they've been there a long time and let certain institutions just sit there peacefully because they've been there a long time if they are not showing a capacity for change. If they're not doing concrete, observable things to show that they have changed. It doesn't matter what your house is or what tribe or family you belong to. If it's not bearing fruit, cut it down. I didn't come from a family with a lot of money or influence per se. I don't recall ever saying, wait till my father hears about this. But looking back, I was a child of some spiritual privilege. From birth, I was deeply, I was part of a deeply devout Christian family. I had countless positive Christian role models. And from age 12, I was what they call a PK, a pastor's kid, with all the rights, privileges, and awkwardness thereunto appertaining. I was an introverted teen suddenly walking into a big church full of people whose names I don't know, but they all know mine. I was out front a lot. I sang, I played guitar, I acted in skits. And I didn't mind it too much at the time, but I did kind of resent the fact that I couldn't turn it off. That is, until college. 700 miles away in Staten Island, New York, where my, by my own design, nobody knew that I was a kid of a pastor. Nobody even knew that I was Christian. I wasn't out front anymore. My faith was no longer being hand-fed to me the way that it was when I was high, in high school. And I struggled spiritually with that transition. And yet God had plans for that time. I made a lot of friends that I never would have known back home, where everybody knew my dad and my family. I met a lot of children of God who frankly didn't have much use for God. I met a lot of friends who might never have felt welcome by my church or any church, even though I had always thought of my church as a welcoming place. I started studying faiths from other parts of the world, from the Eastern Hemisphere, other perspectives on the divine mystery of life. And the people teaching those faiths, I realized, were children of God too. My eyes were opened 
more to who I was and what I believed because I had met other children of God showing genuine love and care for each other and for the world, but who would never fit in with the human institutions that we have created around God. Entering college, there was nothing further than, from my mind than being a pastor like my dad. It didn't even enter my consciousness that that was a possibility. But four years later, after a long and strange spiritual ride, I realized that the church that I grew up in was a human institution that had done a lot of good, but that needed a lot of change. And that change wasn't going to happen if everyone who saw the need for change took off and never came back. So in I went, in deeper, to be, try to be part of the change, part of the fruit-bearing process for the sake of a world that was so hungry for that spiritual fruit. I'm not sure this is wise to say as a pastor who makes my living from a church, I'm not so sure it's wise to say on the same day that we have a big congregational meeting. But the fact is, God does not care about whether congregations or denominations survive or die. God cares about people and God's children inside and outside of the church. That's who God cares about. And if God's people inside the church are having a hard time bearing fruit and helping their neighbor in concrete, observable, measurable ways, then forget it. Cut it down. If Christians are known, whether it's fairly or unfairly, as just a bunch of judgmental, prejudiced hypocrites, and we are doing nothing in our behavior to change that perspective, then forget it. Cut it down. Maybe God can grow something else, something fresh in this soil. And yet I say that, but I'm here because I don't think it's over. Not by a long shot. Not yet. I'm here because I've seen this tree bearing fruit. I've seen the presence under this tree right in the back of the worship space. I saw the huge pile of turkeys under the altar last Thanksgiving and the huge pile of food we gathered this Thanksgiving. I've seen the spiritual growth happening in people's lives. I've seen the light bulb start to turn on. I know that God isn't done with the ELCA or with our little community church in northern Michigan. The fruit is still growing, and it's going to feed the world. People accuse John the Baptist of preaching doom and gloom. Probably it's the unquenchable fire thing that catches us. But the amazing thing about John's ministry is he is preaching a more hopeful message than even he realizes. He says the Messiah will baptize with the Holy Spirit and with fire, and that happens, but not how John pictures. It happens at Pentecost, where all the divisions based on race, based on language, based on tribe, based on where you grew up, melt away in the fire of the Holy Spirit. Even before Jesus shows up on the scene, God is doing something remarkable because the worst of the worst sinners, the most corrupt, the biggest bullies, the people totally working and taking advantage from the system are showing up and repenting. Tax collectors, people profiting off their neighbor's oppression and poverty come to the water. Roman soldiers who make most of their income by looting and extorting come to the water. And instead of saying, nope, sorry, you're toast, John says, yes, there is hope for you. Yes, even you can change. And here are some concrete things that you can do. Don't take advantage of your power and privilege. That's it, that's a start. God will meet you there. There's even hope for the Slytherins, ladies and gentlemen. 
doesn't matter who your father or mother is, doesn't matter what tribe you belong to, where you were or weren't baptized, what church you did or did not grow up in, what you do or don't think about the church today. You are a child of God. Luke's gospel does a fascinating thing. Right after this scene with John the Baptist, Jesus comes up and he's baptized. And then Luke proceeds to do a really long genealogy of Jesus's family tree. But this is different from the other gospels. Matthew's gospel actually leads off at the very beginning in chapter 1 with Jesus' genealogy. And he starts with Abraham because he is trying to lay out Jesus' bona fides as a Jewish Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. Luke waits until now when Jesus is already an adult, already baptized, and we're already getting to know him. And then he does this amazing thing, this genealogy that starts with Jesus, but then goes backwards. At a certain point, he hits Abraham in that list of, Ab of, of ancestors, and he keeps going. Jesus' family tree includes every single human being. He goes all the way back to son of Adam, son of God. Jesus' family tree includes everybody. And even though Luke makes a really big deal about God being Jesus' biological father by Mary, Luke also reminds us that Jesus is the Son of God in the same way that we are all children of God because God began this human family and God is going to stick with us. The Holy Spirit has brought us here, not because we can save ourselves. Only Jesus can do that. But because nobody, nobody, not tax collectors, not Ebenezer Scrooge, not Draco Malfoy, not any single one of us is so set in our ways that God can't bring us to the water and change us. Nobody is too far gone. Anyone, anyone can change. It happened then. It's happening now. And it happens every day. You can see it. Give thanks to God and taste that worthy spiritual fruit. Amen. We hope you'll come and worship with us at 930 every Sunday. We also stream that service on YouTube if you're too far away to be able to make it and join us. Advent members, we hope that you will tune in tomorrow for a, our um, annual meeting. Uh, we have a member meeting where we're going to where we're going to approve our 2022 budget. It will be streamed on YouTube, but in order to participate and vote, we do ask that you come in person. So if you want to look back over, you can certainly uh, do that on YouTube. Uh, but we ask you to please come. Um, and also want to let you know about our Christmas Eve services. We have a Christmas Eve service at 4 p.m. that's geared towards children and families. And we have a candlelight service at 8.30 p.m. And we'd be so honored if you would join us and welcome Christ the Lord. We'll see you around.